Hello, folks. I'm Josh McGee. Welcome to another episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, here I am back after the inaugural episode last week in which I said I wouldn't be doing this every week over the summer. But there's so much soccer going on here in St. Louis and, of course, all over the world that I had to get in another episode. In case you missed last week, uh, my return with a brand new episode of the GTSS, go and check that out. There's some really cool stuff in there, including some comments from Minnesota Aurora FC goalkeeper and former University of Vanderbilt goalkeeper and kicker Sarah Fuller. She talks a lot about uh, her time with Minnesota and a lot of other serious subjects. I definitely would encourage you all to go and check out that small interview that I did after their match versus the St. Louis Lions. She had a lot to say on a lot of important stuff. But here we are in this week's episode. Like I said, was out to plenty of soccer matches here in St. Louis over this past weekend. I want to get through all of what I saw, some of the comments from a few of the coaches and maybe a player or so here in this episode. So that'll be one half of this show. The other half will be, I just kind of pulled, you know, random soccer topics from this past week, you know, from a variety of different places, you know, internationally, club level, here in the U.S., just a bunch of different things going on that I kind of want to discuss briefly with you all. So that'll be the other half of the episode. But again, like I said, was at a lot of matches. You'll hear from Club Atletico. You're going to hear from the St. Louis Lions. Uh, Again, plenty of other different stuff. And of course, we'll look ahead to this upcoming weekend and what's going to be coming here for St. Louis soccer. But like I said, we're going to start off with some storylines from soccer around the world. First up, got to talk about the U.S. men's national team needing a stoppage time equalizer from Jordan Morris in order to secure a 1-1 draw versus El Salvador in CONCACAF Nations League action. Both teams finished with 10 men as U.S. men's national team's Paul Ariola received a red card in the 70th minute. It was just a brutal, you know, knockdown, dragout match played on a terrible pitch. I mean, it was so muddy by the end of this. Uh, it looked like a military training exercise, basically. It was just horrible playing conditions. Again, both teams uh, finishing with 10 men. I definitely didn't think that red card areola was warranted. Again, El Salvador picked one up just a few minutes later. It was nothing pretty. It was your typical CONCACAF, just absolutely insane type of match. And I definitely think, you know, in terms of looking at the lineup, there were a lot of regulars involved. You know, Christian Pulisic did play. You saw Eunice Musa. Uh, again, you saw kind of the uh, center back pairing there of Cameron Carter-Vickers and Aaron Law. Probably a, a dark horse possible candidate there in terms of something we could see at the World Cup, but probably not. But still, there were a lot of, uh, you know, players involved here. Ethan Pohrdath got the start and goal, kind of had a little bit of a mistake there on the goal that he did give up. So there are a lot of bits and pieces to take away from this match. But in the end, again, guys, I don't think the U.S., they're going to have any problems here. I know that this, you know, setback puts them behind El Salvador in their group. They still got a couple matches to play. I think they come up in March 2023, if I am correct, in terms of one more match each versus El Salvador and Grenada. The U.S. will figure it out. It's all about the World Cup right now. Obviously, these types of results, you know, you don't want to have them. But it's important to kind of find ways to pull out results, to grind out results. You never know in World Cup group stage, if you're going to need a draw, you got to find a way to score a goal late. Jordan Morris is the guy who picked it up here. I think it's his first goal since returning from his ACL injury, so good to see him get on the score sheet, but it's too early right now. We still have a lot of questions about the U.S. men's national team and who all is going to be involved. This was not, you know, the full potential starting lineup here versus El Salvador, so I'm not really too concerned about things. Uh, This was just a match, you know, that they kind of have to get through in order to push through here in the summer and start getting down to brass tacks about who's going to be making that World Cup roster. So again, yeah, you don't want to be drawing with El Salvador, but when you look at the conditions and you look at the circumstances and who all was out there in terms of just not being the full starting 11, I'm going to give the U.S. a pass on this one. Okay, these next couple of stories have to deal with some transfer news at the club level. Big signings in the Premier League. The two top teams from last season, really the two top teams from the past couple of seasons, Manchester City and Liverpool each signed a prolific striker this past week to their squad. Manchester City, they've been after this guy for a long time, finally able to complete this deal for Borussia Dortmund striker Erling Allen. They activated his near 60 million euro release clause in order to get that deal done. Liverpool responded by signing Benfica striker Darwin Nunez in a deal for a transfer fee around 75 million euros. Of course, add-ons for both deals are really going to pump them up to even larger, you know, kind of fees and totals there. But again, both strikers have proven their worth so far over the past season or two. Allen scored 86 goals in 89 matches with Dortmund over a two and a half season span. 
While Nunez, this past season, he was the top scorer for Benfica. He was the top scorer in the Portuguese first division after he scored 34 goals in 41 matches. Both guys also had tremendous success with their teams in the Champions League. So it's a little bit of a whatever you can do, I can do better type of thing with these two teams. And really, it's the final piece for both of them. Both have struggled to find that prolific, you know, in the box type of striker who consistently can bang in goals. Obviously, with Manchester City, Gabriel Jesus was supposed to be the heir apparent to Sergio Aguero. That has not played out. He's looking potentially to make a move to Arsenal. And of course, you know, when you can get Erling Holland, one of the top, not just young players in the game, but one of the top players overall, especially offensively in world soccer, you've got to do it. Of course, the connection with his father, of course, playing for Manchester City was a captain for them at one time. It makes perfect sense. With Liverpool, of course, Roberto Firmino has fallen by the wayside. And if rumors are going to be true that they could lose Sadio Mane as well, they're going to need some goals. And Nunez can help provide that. He can lead that attack. He can provide himself as an outlet for Liverpool to spring a counterattack. And of course, he can link up with Mo Salah and form a deadly strike force there. So again, the rich get richer. Both these teams, it's an arms race right now. They've clearly separated themselves from the likes of Chelsea, Manchester United, and the rest of the Premier League. Alan, huge signing in terms of just, you know, Big name, world talent. Nunez, of course, though, right behind him, honestly, in terms of production. So both these teams get a heck of a lot better. And it's going to be really interesting to see how they can develop and how they can fit within these teams and how quickly they can do it in terms of the Premier League race and, of course, Champions League action as well. The other transfer story, according to sources, Paul Pogba is set to leave Manchester United and join Juventus on a free transfer, signing a brand new four-year contract. During Pogba's first stint with Juventus, he won four consecutive league titles in his four years with that club and also won two Coppa Italia titles. It was honestly the best time of his career. Of course, remember, he started at Manchester United, eventually made that move to Juventus, became a huge star, then returned to Manchester United for a then world record fee. It was close to like 90 million year, uh, pounds, I think it was at the time. And of course, you know, just never really got things going. There was, you know, bits and flashes of the talent that Manchester United expect to get back but he just never seemed to fit in with the likes of Jose Mourinho. Of course, recently, Ole Gunnar Skolshar, just it never worked out. So he's going back to Juventus. I think this is a great move for him. I'm still a Paul Pogba fan. I definitely think he still has a lot to offer, but you know, his mind, his mentality just not, has just not been correct since joining Manchester United. He should be a lot more of an imposing figure in the midfield than he has been. And you know, going back to where he had his most success, going back to, I believe, Allegri, you know, the manager there, who got the best out of him. Uh, this is a solid move for him to get back to being one of the world's best because that is what he is capable of. And of course, you know, with the World Cup coming up, you want to help solidify your spot. Pogba has been out of form. So in terms of getting back to how he used to play, and potentially getting his World Cup spot back there with France, this is a move that is necessary for him. So I'd be interested to see if he can seamlessly transition back into Syria. Ah, pick up where he left off with Juventus or if this is more of a permanent state of his career, what he was doing at Manchester United, and he will continue to disappoint. Moving on to some World Cup news. The field is complete. The last two spots have been filled at the 2022 FIFA World Cup, and they've been filled by Australia and Costa Rica. Australia were able to narrowly defeat Peru in a penalty kick shootout 5-4, to four, thanks to a save by substitute goalkeeper Andrew Redmayne, who was able to seal the deal there for the Socceroos. So they will be moving on to the World Cup. And they'll be joined by Costa Rica, who got a goal in the third minute from Joel Campbell and were able to hold on for a 1-0 victory versus New Zealand. So congrats to both those teams. Again, finding a way to get in. Both very familiar over the past couple of World Cups of getting in, maybe you know, causing a little bit of a disturbance. Costa Rica, of course, had a deep run a couple of World Cups ago. I don't think they're going to have much of a chance uh, looking at the groups that they will be joined. But still, you never know. This is the type of momentum that can sometimes spring some type of a World Cup run, you know, getting in as one of the last few teams through a playoff. So again, congrats to those teams. A lot of experience, of course, being in multiple different World Cups over the past few tries. We'll see what happens, but it's still very exciting to think about. The field is complete. Now we're going to work through the summer and see how these teams develop, who's going to make these squads, and who will be showing up in Qatar in November. Next up, I want to talk about the UEFA Nations League because there have been some pretty interesting developments going on there over the course of this month. Specifically, at least starting off with the holders in France. They're not going to make it out of their group. That is because they've gone winless in their first four matches, a couple of losses here and there to the likes of Denmark and Croatia. The thing is, they've never 
kind of fielded their strongest 11. They've been trying to get a lot of guys rest, a lot of guys, you know, playing long into the season. You think about someone like Akili Mbappe, uh, Kareem Benzema, of course, you know, playing in the Champions League final. They want to get all these guys rest. But the problem has been, it's just been kind of a bunch of jumbled different lineups and they've never been able to establish some cohesiveness. And that is what has led to some of these losses to really good clubs. Again, Croatia, Denmark, those are great teams. But the fact that they haven't been able to pick up one win with all the talent that they have, I don't know, some warning bells. As we know, France, you know, especially after winning a World Cup, their performances in the following World Cup, not always the best. I talked about them being the favorite, and that's because of all the talent that they have. Of course, you know, guys getting rest, that is important, but it has not looked pretty so far for France, especially here in the Nations League. They're not going to get out of their group. They're not going to be able to repeat their title there in kind of, you know, the A section of the Nations League. So maybe a little bit of a cause for concern. They're going to miss out on some things because of these results. But still, again, hasn't been their strongest 11. We'll have to see what that looks like here in the coming months. Speaking of disappointments, England suffered their worst loss on home soil since 1928 in a 4-0 beatdown at the hands of Hungary. Also in their group, Germany crushed Italy by a score of 5-2 to move in front of them by one point. Two crazy results here, right? England, again, also going to be one of those favorites to win the World Cup. Absolutely getting it handed to them by Hungary, who are actually at the top of this group. They are ahead of England, Germany, and Italy. That's kind of a shock right there. Uh, but again, you know, trying to figure things out right now. England, again, just like France, they have loads of talent. If they're resting people, it's the same thing. There should still be enough for them to pick up some types of results. This one, you know, you can kind of accept a loss, but not of this magnitude. That's going to have a little bit of some warning bells going off there in England. Germany versus Italy, Timo Werner scoring a couple of goals. I talked about them having their younger players step up. Italy, what's going on there? The free fall continues. They don't have a World Cup to get ready for, so they should be putting all their eggs in the Nations League basket. That's not the result that's going to get it done there as well. So again, a couple of big results there in Group B of the A section of the Nations League. Again, same thing with France and England. Still a lot of time left. It's more so just kind of with France, it's the string of results that are kind of concerning, not picking up one win out of those four matches. And with England, just, you know, the 4-0 scoreline is kind of the louder problem in terms of then, you know, besides the loss to Hungary. So, again, a lot of time left for these teams, but still some interesting results to start paying attention to with some of these bigger favorites looking forward to the World Cup. Then lastly, I wanted to point out this team behind me right here, the Netherlands. They maintained their unbeaten run to start things off in the Nations League. They were able to overcome a 92nd minute penalty by Gareth Bale. They got a winner from Memphis Depay a minute later to win that match over Wales by a score of 3-2. to two. The Netherlands, something to look out for here right now. Could be a potential opponent in the knockout stage for the United States. The U.S. You know, finished second in Group B. The Netherlands finished first in Group A. That would be the matchup. Right now, the Netherlands look really good. Of course, they just beat Belgium by a couple of goals a few matches ago. Again, here, finding a way to pull out a victory versus Wales. A couple of World Cup you know, qualifiers there. Team to look out for. Again, Memphis Depay doing great things up top. On the offensive end, getting a lot of defensive help. You know, Virgil van Dijk, Matthias De Ligt, a lot of talent back there as well. So the Netherlands could be starting to put it back together again, getting back to that form that saw them get all the way to the World Cup final there in 2010. They got the talent to potentially make a run, and right now the results are showing that. Moving over to some women's soccer, the U.S. women's national team announced their roster for the upcoming CONCACAF W Championship this summer. Some familiar faces returning to the squad. Megan Rapino and Alex Morgan are back in the team for the first time since October of 2021. Also joining them, St. Louis's own Becky Sauerbrunn, who missed the April friendlies uh, due to an injury, but all three are back in the team. A lot of familiar faces in there as well, but a lot of players absent, mostly because of recovering from injury. You think about someone like a Sam Mewis, and of course, unfortunately, recently that list has grown with Katarina Macario and Kristen Press. Both players in recent weeks, Press, this just this past weekend, uh, tore their ACL. They're going to be facing some long recoveries there. Now, head coach Vladko Endovanovsky did say that Press wasn't going to make the team anyway, but still, you don't want to see these injuries start to pile up for the U.S. You also have someone like Crystal Dunn, who is out right now, you know, taking care of the birth of her child. So a lot of people missing for the U.S. women's national team, but still, that gives opportunities to those who have been itching to break into the team. Trinity Rodman, back in the U.S. women's national team. She has been on fire. It was a great piece the other week on SportsCenter about her career and, of course, her upbringing uh, and some of the details there. 
a really cool piece. But again, she's been doing great things. A lot of other excellent young talent in this team as well. We're going to compete here in the CONCACAF W Championship. And again, you know, these competitions, it's important for the U.S. to continue to establish their dominance in CONCACAF. And of course, always prepping for the next World Cup and Olympic cycle. So again, interesting to see this roster this summer. Always an exciting opportunity to see this U.S. Women's National Team play. Some familiar faces are back in Rapino, in Sauerbrunn, and in Morgan. So it's going to be a great summer of women's soccer here for the U.S. Another women's soccer story here real quick. In this past weekend's 4-0 win over the Houston Dash, Portland Thorns FC forward Olivia Moultrie became the youngest player in NWSL history to score a goal. 16 years old, she scored, I believe, in the 74th minute to cap off that 4-0 win versus Houston. Just a great moment. We talked about her struggles here on the show, just about, you know, signing that professional contract, challenging the rules of the NWSL to allow her to play. She was successful in that challenge, of course, signed on when she was just 15 years old. Now, here a year later, 16 years old, she scores her first professional goal. An exciting and excellent accomplishment for her. Of course, part of a great Portland Thorns team. Uh, she is a part of that future, not just for Portland, but also for the U.S. Women's National Team as well. And exciting to see her career off to a great start. So congratulations to her, 16 years old, youngest player ever to score in NWSL history. The last two stories I want to bring up here are from MLS. Of course, the big news this week was the big time deal agreed upon between MLS and Apple TV, a 10 year deal worth $2.5 billion to stream every match live on the Apple TV app. Fans will also have access to League Cup and select MLS Next Pro matches as well. No local blackouts is going to be the big thing here with this type of deal. Of course, big money for the league. Exciting new opportunity, a new streaming partner here uh, between MLS and Apple TV. Also, fans who are season ticket holders will be able to enjoy access to this program for free. That's going to be a big thing there. Uh, again, Apple TV are also going to have, you know, whip round shows showing a bunch of different matches. They're going to have local programming, uh, some local content there from all the teams involved. This is going to be really exciting. Again, I know, you know, fans and other people are not going to be so excited about having to sign up for another, you know, premium streaming service. But still, the important thing here is that every match is going to be available to everyone. No local blackouts. Uh, again, content, you're still going to get your local content. Some of your broadcasters that you like are still going to be involved. But this is an important step about, you know, firming up that base to where you can easily find MLS. I know they're still working on deals potentially with ESPN and some other different partners. But still, it's important to be able to find somewhere that Major League Soccer can always be found a streaming live. So again, this is going to be a huge landmark deal. 10 years, 2.5 billion. That's a huge number. And very excited to see, of course, obviously, you know, St. Louis City SC joining up next season. Interested to see how they will attack uh, this, you know, platform, this format for their matches. But still, I think this is mostly good news here for fans to have access to Major League Soccer now on Apple TV. And lastly, whenever a World Cup champion decides to join MLS, I think it's a huge news story. And that is what happened this past week. Juventus legend and World Cup champion with Italy, Giorgio Chiellini, has signed with LAFC. 37-year-old has signed a contract through the 2023 season. He will be joining up with LAFC next month in July. Very exciting, of course, Chiellini. He brings so much experience, uh, so much still talent, even at 37 years old. He has helped Juventus again win countless league titles, Champions League success, and of course, again, World Cup champion and a Euro champion with Italy. Again, just so much pedigree there that LAFC had to jump at the chance to bring him in there. He will help shore up defense. LAFC, again, very successful right now in the Western Conference. And so they add to what is a very talented team. I still think Kalini has something left in the tank. I think he's very excited about a brand new opportunity here, a chance to contribute to a winning team right away. So I think this is going to be a good partnership. Again, obviously, you know, he's not going to be the same as signing, you know, some 23-year-old, you know, who's just entering their prime, but still someone who has plenty of experience, plenty of leadership experience as well. LAFC, they've kind of faltered there in these close pressurized situations down the stretch. They haven't been able to make that push to an MLS Cup. Kalini is the type of guy with the intangibles who can help them get over the hump. So those are just some of the biggest news stories from the past week in the world of soccer that caught my eye. Again, there's going to be a lot going on in the summer, despite the fact that we don't have a World Cup going on right now. I know recently, again, the Premier League schedule just dropped. May take a look at that uh, during the next show, you know, in the coming weeks or so, but still always something going on in soccer. Now I want to shift focus over to this past week in soccer 
in St. Louis. Again, I was out at plenty of different matches over the weekend, but a lot going on elsewhere as well. I want to start off by talking about City 2. They crushed Chicago Fire 2 in Chicago by a score of 5-0. Five, five different goal scorers got on the score sheet and got the job done for St. Louis. Again, very exciting times. They now catapult themselves into third place. Again, one of those four playoff spots there in the Western Conference. Big match tonight. They take on their rivals, Sporting Kansas City 2 here uh, on the road in Kansas City. Again, big opportunity there to pick up three more points, continue to separate themselves, and to hold on to one of those playoff spots. Sporting KC, they're out of the playoff hunt right now, I believe by a couple of different places. So an opportunity here uh, to pick up some points on the road before they return home in the coming weeks and continue their schedule. So again, City 2 continuing to dominate. Again, five different goal scorers. That's extremely impressive. You know, Josh Dolan, again, the team's leading goal scorer was one of those uh, guys who got on the score sheet, but still important to have that type of depth and to have multiple different guys being able to get involved in the offense. So City 2, they continue to roll, and we'll see how things go uh, versus Sporting KC here tonight. As far as the other local area clubs, Fire and Ice Soccer Club continued their stellar undefeated run to start the WPSL season with two wins on the road this past weekend. They defeated Iowa Raptors FC by a score of 3 0 and Quad Cities Rush by a score of 6 1. So far to start the year, they have outscored their opponents 17 2 to begin the season here in their opening four matches. Just an incredible run to begin things here for Fire and Ice, definitely establishing themselves near the top of their division as well as potentially putting themselves in play for a playoff spot. You can go and check them out at All Top High School this weekend. They will be at home for two matches. Up next, one of the matches I was at this past weekend, Club Atletico St. Louis got a fantastic strike from Ethan Blake in the first half, and then stellar defense and goalkeeping from Eric Bauschi in order to secure the 1-0 victory versus Sunflower State FC. This was the second win in a row for Club Atletico, starting to make a little bit of a run and potentially maybe move themselves up to the top part of their division. But this was a great performance, a great strike by Blake. And then, yeah, the back line led by Josh Ward, a captain there, was able to hold on for the clean sheet. It was really, though, Eric Bauschi who stole the show, made some spectacular saves down the stretch to help Club Atletico hold on for this victory. After the match, I talked with head coach Ricky Garza and with goalkeeper Eric Bauschi about the win, about the continued momentum that they've been able to kind of, you know, take a hold of here down the stretch and where this puts them at as they head into the final part of their season. This was uh, another complete game. The last one I felt was the Arkansas Wolves. We won 1-0 that game. It was complete defensively. Our structure tonight was fantastic. It was They took what we did on the training ground this week and they applied it in the game. I did feel we could have put off, you know, put it away earlier. There's a couple goals we've missed on crosses, probably three quality chances, but we'll take the 1-0. The guys deserve it. The guys all around. The whole bench was able to utilize, and I think that's what makes us as a weapon. I still have about four or five guys that didn't make the roster this game, so we're super deep, and everyone is just, you know, flying through all the levels that is necessary. Talk about the team's discipline, because again, after you guys, you know, you give up the goal, or you get the goal, excuse me, and then you know, you're trying to search for that second one, it's not starting to come, so you get in a little bit of that defensive mode. A lot of set pieces here tonight that you guys dealt with. Also, just the trust in your team to put on those five or so subs at the end, and for them to help lock down the clean sheet, Talk to me about how they were able to pull through on that end tonight. It definitely changes the game whenever we can keep Noah, Mako, Josh, and Edwards in the back line. Now we can be more aggressive around the box. You know, we can knock some guys, maybe give up some fouls, because we know we got the big guys that are going to take care of those. Um, that changes the game because it allows us to be a much more high-pressing team, even in our half of the field. So I think that's why we were able to do what we did. A uh, huge trust in Eric. Uh, if Greg would have played, we would have still got a result the same way. They're both studs, but Eric definitely kept us in the game and kept the clean sheet. In terms of moving forward again now, that's two wins on the bounce. In terms of just, you know, of course, obviously the season is great to have you guys back, but now you're starting to put wins together, starting to make a little bit of a challenge, and winning these close games. Talked about how much that is going to play effect in terms of how you guys end this season that you have this type of experience. Well, just like when we first started, I told the guys, we have a culture here at Atletico. It's, I'm not the guy that's going to lose sleep if we don't win the conference. I'm not the guy that's going to lose sleep if we lose games, as long as we've executed some things that we did in training. Therefore, as we get better each week and we get some results, it will just naturally come into form that, hey, we, have, we can go for the playoff. Hey, we can go for the conference. But I told them I'm loyal to them and the program, which is focused on development first and results second. Like tonight, as you've seen, everybody bought in to their role, their developmental role of what they're supposed to do. And then 
we outplayed the opponent. I didn't feel that there was any threat other than a few set pieces. Yeah, it's a great feeling to get a win. You know, like two in a row is a big step for us. We're starting to come together as a team, and, you know, I think we'll just keep climbing up in the standings, and I think there's a bright future in the years to come with Atletico. So in terms of your performance here tonight, it was really needed after you guys took the lead. Some really big saves. One that sticks out to mind was on their free kick, kind of a set play. Quick reaction, ball going to the top corner. You had to make a spectacular save. A few down the stretch as well. Talk to me about your perspective here tonight, uh, some of the shots that you were seeing, how you would make those saves. Yeah, no, I mean, it's hard. We get up a lot of corner kicks, a lot of set pieces. So we got to say congrats to the guys as well because they defended everyone to get the clean sheet. It's not just my save or my performance. It's everyone from the back line all the way up to the striker. I think, you know, defending hard for 90 minutes is something that's going to win a soccer game, and that's what we did. Obviously, you know, Atletico coming back this season, finally getting to be back on the pitch is one thing, but to get together and put together a couple wins, like you said, start to make a climb here in the stands has to feel good right now. You know, looking forward here over the next few weeks as you get to the, you know, the big part of the season here down the stretch, things in terms of talking a little bit about, you know, team chemistry, what you guys have been working on, and especially with these couple wins, how much it shows at this point. Yeah, it feels so good because last year, you know, we didn't have a season, so everyone was just training. So to come out here and put together two wins back to back means a lot. And, you know, the, te- the chemistry is coming with the guys. You know, we're all hanging out after games and stuff. So, I mean, it feels good. It feels good. I'm proud to be a part of Atletico. I appreciate Coach Garza and Eric speaking with me after the match. Club Atletico are on the road tonight and tomorrow for their next upcoming matches. Moving over to the St. Louis Lions, want to talk about the women's team first. They suffered a tough setback this past weekend, losing at home by a score of 6-1 to one versus the Chicago Dutch Lions. Then in midweek, going on the road versus Chicago City SC, they lost that match narrowly by a score of 1-0. Tough going right now for the St. Louis Lions women's team. They have not been able to come up with their first three points of the season. Improvements have been made, but it was definitely a huge setback versus the Dutch Lions. The heat was intense that day. Chicago scored early and often, and really the Lions were playing catch-up from the jump. They also finished that match with just 10 players, uh, received a red card late on in the second half. It was a tough display, and I know head coach Jeff Lorimer talked about, you know, trying to figure things out right now, establishing some continuity within the starting 11 and putting it all together. The improvements from last year have been made, but still looking for those first three points of the season. They will be back in action on ho- at home on Father's Day in terms of the next match that you can go and check them out. And lastly, the St. Louis Lions men's team maintained their unbeaten run to start the season in USL League 2. This past week at home, they drew 2-2 versus first place Chicago FC United and then went on the road in midweek in Chicago to take on the Dutch Lions. They won that match in dramatic fashion by a score of 3-2. Manny O'Reilly scored a goal in both matches for the Lions. I was at that match versus Chicago FC United this past Sunday. Again, top of the table clash, first versus second place. A lot of chances there for the Lions. They actually hit the woodwork three different times. Plenty of opportunities to come away with the full three points. So a little bit of a disappointment there, but still have maintained their unbeaten run to start the season in a year, again, where they're coming off of that year where they missed out. They weren't in action. They come back. They jump right back into USL League Two and are up near the top of the table. After the match, I had the chance to talk to head coach Tony Glavin about the performance, about the team this season, coming back after that year off and what it has meant for them and just how they've been able to put it together so far this season. I thought overall we, we played well. Uh, first half, you know, the, uh, the other team were a good team. I mean, that's, that's the first thing. We saw that right from the start. Uh, there's no doubt about, you know, how they play. They play fast. They play quick with, with the ball. One touch, two touch. They keep it moving. And that just kind of keeps us moving so you know we 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 knew what to expect coming into the game you know you get a goal behind and you know it was early seven minutes in and you know the question is can you can you respond and I, and I thought we uh, we responded in great fashion you know and I, I, I thought at that point we you know we, we did so many good things you know from then on in the first half you know hitting the crossbar in fact goal goes in and you know, it changes the game for us, you know. Although once we did get the second goal, I thought, again, we're, we're noses in front. You know, we got to try and get another. And then all of a sudden, penalty kick. And uh, I really couldn't see. Well, didn't, certainly didn't look like penalty, but, you know, I'm far away from it. I can't see. So, you know, you, you just got to go with that's that's the referee's decision, you know. But then we've we've hit the post twice. I mean, it's... It's just unbelievable. Just uh, the luck. So I thought we created the best chances in the second half to, to finish the game. 
you know. So, you know, I, I guess we're, we're, we're happy we took something out of the game, but I felt that we probably should have taken all three points. Uh, of course, it keeps your guys' unbeaten start to the season. A lot of great wins before this match. Of course, the 7-2 match uh, versus the other Chicago team as well. Talk to me about during this run what you guys have been doing well to get these types of results. Well, I think just overall the quality of the players that we have here, we've got, we've got good depth in the squad. And I think that that's proven with, with the lads, you know, when we make a couple of changes or... You know, sometimes it's more than a couple of changes. You know, we've we've proven that uh, th those players can uh, equally do the job, and and for some, it just it just keeps keeps on going. So that keeps the level of play always up. And I think that that for the players to know that there's competition in every area of the field, I think is it keeps them on their toes. So and it keeps them playing well. And just in terms of coming back out this year, I know I had to be tough sitting out a year on the men's side and then to come back and have, you know, the normal process to have tryouts. It's really an indictment, a positive one, at least so far with the results that you've been getting that, you know, you guys trusted the process and you were able to push through and come up with this type of season. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, being able to get to this point. Yeah, definitely. I, I know just for me personally, it was very challenging uh, two years not seeing players, it, was almost, it seemed like a, a lifetime, you know. Uh, but when players come back, you know, Charlie and, uh, you know, Liam and Goals uh, had said to me, oh, we, we played three years ago. And I said, no, it was only two years ago. And then when I thought about it, 2019, oh, it was three, three years ago. Yeah, you're right. It just seemed it was a long, long time ago. And I, so I, I, I think, you know, I know, I know for myself, you know, seeing the guys, it was great. It kind of brought me around. And I, I'm fortunate, very fortunate. I've got Martin Clays. I've got uh, Jake um, Alvernia from, from Missouri Baptist. We've got Brock Chap. You know Chapman. We got another young lad, Aiden Rahill. Aiden played for me three years ago, and he's back as kind of an intern. So I got a great support staff. So I certainly can't take uh, all the credit for how the, the boys have been doing because Martin's been the lead on that, and uh, those other guys I mentioned. You know, I'm basically filling in for them today, and uh, I think they've they've done a great job at keeping the lads, you know, the uh, very upbeat everybody working hard and keeping it competitive and it's you know it's, it's it's been great the one thing i think for the players that's helped us is that we had an upsurge of players interested in playing i think coming out of two years of covid from from their college standpoint you know it was a very challenging time for colleges the same as everyone and i think so for the players it was uh, they were hungry and hungry to play and I think that's helped us. My thanks to Tony for speaking with me after the match. The Lions are back in action at home tomorrow night before they go off on a lengthy road trip over the next couple of weeks. So you want to be sure and go and check them out. That's going to do it for this episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. A little bit of a shorter episode this week, but still a lot of soccer news to get to. A lot of great St. Louis soccer action going on. Another busy weekend here coming up with some local matches as well. I'm going to try to go out and cover as much as I can. No show next week. Got some family things to take care of, but potentially either next week or, you know, a little bit further on down the line will be the next episode of the GTSS. Of course, that family stuff starts this weekend. Hopefully everyone has a happy Father's Day. Shout out to all the dads out there, especially new dads. I feel like I've seen a lot on social media and, of course, within my friends group as well. A lot of brand new dads here potentially celebrating their first Father's Day. Uh, congratulations. Have a happy Father's Day. Again, shout out to my dad, all the dads out there. And of course, you get another couple of great weeks coming up here in local STL soccer. A lot going on, of course, internationally as well. Just a great time, of course, here in the summer to be talking about the beautiful game. But again, hopefully everyone can focus on, on some family stuff here this weekend. And I'll be talking with you all very soon. Have a good weekend.